Hello, folks. It's Andy, the analytical preacher. There's an area where I notice that Christians have a very wide attitude when it comes to their opinions, and that has to do with the environment, or maybe you would say with environmentalism, climate change, those sorts of things. It's not just an area where there's a pretty wide range of Christians. It's also an area where I'm not sure either side is really all that close to being biblically accurate. I think both sides are sort of too far on one extreme or the other. So in this podcast, I thought I would just talk a little bit about how would a biblical worldview, how would a Bible foundation sort of direct us relative to this topic? Let me kind of lay out. Here's how the two sides, I I think, sort of see it. The one side says, the earth is a gift from God. The earth is our gift from God, and we can do with it whatever we want to do with it. Uh, If someone says to me, here's a car, it's yours. I'm going away. You'll never see me again. If I want to treat the car with kid gloves, I can. And if I want to tear the car up, drag racing within a year or two, then I can do that as well. And I think some folks kind of see it as God has given us this gift and it's ours. We can do what we want. Why is everybody complaining about how we're treating the earth. The other side, I think, and and I sort of call them the mother earth folks, and they'll oftentimes use that phrase. The other side kind of has this mother earth sort of approach. They, They sometimes will slip into this idea that earth itself or that that other features or that other creatures on the earth have the same status, deserve the same status, as humans have. But humans were given by God a different and elevated status. So it's not quite, it's ours, I can do what I want to with it. I'll ravage it and destroy it. And it's not quite the earth. We're no better than the ants or the anything else on the earth. We're no better than the crust of the earth itself. And so we should not use anything, leave no imprint on the earth, etc. The truth comes in between those two. Let's, of course, start to nail this topic down by looking at some scripture. The first thing that's very important to help this first group understand, Psalm 24, 1, for example, says this, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell therein. Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 says, and God blessed them after he had created Adam and Eve. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So Genesis 128, we're not just told you can use the earth and its resources for food and clothing and shelter. It's even a stronger word. God says, you're my stewards of the earth. You are my own site managers of the earth, but I need you to subdue the earth. I need you to have dominion over the earth and the things that live on the earth. Now, remember, they're mine, the fullness of the earth. Everything belongs to me. I've talked about in other podcasts before that really this dominion and subdue ideas is really God's way of telling us that we need to pursue scientific advancements. We need to try to understand how the world works. We need to try to leverage it through technological advancements, etc. So that's how this subdue and have dominion concept sort of has application in our lives today, I think. But again, the, the point of this is to say, if grandma says, here's a car, do what you want with it. I'm about to pass away. I don't really care. That's one thing. But that's not what grandma said. Grandma said, you're going away to college. I will loan you a car. I have two cars in my garage. I will loan you one, but I'm going to continue to pay the monthly payment. I'm going to continue to pay the insurance. Now use it for whatever you need at college. If you need to drive across campus, if you want to drive home for the holidays, if it's ice and windy and snowy outside, don't worry about using the car. Say you get a part-time job to help pay your tuition. Don't worry about driving the car and the ice and the wind and the rain, as long as you're using it for valid reasons. So one side shouldn't chastise us and say, how could you take your grandmother's car 
and run it through the snow with all that salt on the roads and everything. No, no, no. Grandma said I could use it for things like getting to class, getting to my part-time job. On the other hand, of course we would say, we don't want to abuse this machine because this car and the fullness thereof real, really still belongs to Grandma. She's only letting me use it for my benefit. That's how I would sort of piece those two Bible verses together to sort of help us to understand. There's an obvious real world problem. If we take the extreme position of what I call sort of the progressive environmentalist, the progressive environmentalists essentially say that the earth and all of her resources hold an equal. A few have even made arguments that the earth and her resources hold a greater position of status than do humans, and therefore we should essentially be leaving the world untouched. That's just not what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that we are the crown of God's creation because we are made in his image, that we can use the earth and its resources, and that we are to, in fact, subdue the earth and have dominion over it. But again, Here's my concern with the other side. I believe historically Christians have abused the earth too much. I think we've taken this idea instead of we're stewards of grandma's car for a while until we get back from college. We take it as it's ours and we can do what we want. There's two problems, and I'm not going to get into this second one. Obviously, a second problem is I think some past generations have not done a real good job of thinking about future generations. Any Christian has to think not just about love my neighbors that are literally around my house right now, but love my neighbors in the terms of maybe those who would come to live on the earth in the future. And so things just like when you look at things like the way we've stripped mine for coal or how in the past we have cut down trees faster than we have planted them and caused soil erosion and things like that. There's really just been some ways we've allowed some industry to pollute water uh, simply because they could make donations to the politicians to keep the politicians from passing the laws that limit that type of pollution. Just some really basic 101 type stuff that I think almost any rational person, and especially a Christian who says the earth is one of God's greatest gifts to mankind, and I am to take care of the earth. I have dominion over it, but I'm his steward for it. I'm the on-site manager, and I must take care And to do that, and the way in the past that we've allowed water to be polluted or that we've stripped mine for coal or that we've deforested different places and harmed the underlying land is just really unacceptable, in my opinion, from a biblical standpoint. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't cut down trees. We can cut down trees to build houses and we can cut down trees to build boats and we can cut down trees to start fires. I don't have a problem with any of that, but clearly there's a reasonable way to do that to manage it and then a way not to do that. There are ways today that we can drill for oil, for example, which have very little environmental impact, ways that we can drill for natural gas that have very little environmental impact. We can run our factories today with scrubbers on smokestacks, has very little environmental impact. The progressive extremists, the progressive environmentalists may say, All of those things are wrong, but biblically, they're simply not wrong. It's only when we do it in a way that's obviously just a gross misuse that harms the gift that God gave us, would a Christian come out against it. The way I read scripture, this idea about subduing the earth and having dominion over it, I believe that God, because he is a creative God, it's one of the first things the Bible tells us about God. In the beginning, God created God wants us to know and he wants us to know early. I'm a creator and I made you in my image. You go be creators. And I truly believe when we are creative in our use of the earth and its resources, it's pleasing to God. And I think we can all agree there's a line you can cross where that creatively using a gift that God gave us crosses into abusing a gift like we don't respect or love God for giving it to us. Now, here's the truth. Reasonable Christians will draw that line. Where is the line between creativity 
of a resource and abuse of a resource, where is that line drawn? Reasonable Christians who honestly care about the environment, who honestly care about their grandchildren, who honestly love God, will draw that line in different places. In today's political environment, everybody has just decided we're going to yell at everybody else about everything we disagree on. And we're going to call each other evil and bigots and everything else. To my Christian brothers and sisters out there, we really do not need to participate in this. It is okay if you think that this use of the environment is abuse and I think it's not or I think this use is going too far and you don't. As Christians, we should be able to sit down and honestly understand. We may draw that line in different places. What I am saying in this podcast is there is a line to be drawn between creative use and abuse. I think rational honest Christians ought to be able to find that line and figure it out. Let let me make a really quick side note because I get this question very, very often. Some folks have asked me, does the Bible require us, does the Bible encourage us to be vegans or to be vegetarians? Is God more pleased if we're vegans uh, vegans or vegetarians? Is it more respectful of the environment if we are vegans or vegetarians? So some version of that question. And the answer is really no. The Bible does not require it. It doesn't push us in that direction. It's not better off necessarily. If you go back to Genesis 9, when Noah and his family came off the boat, God says this, Genesis 9, verse 3, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. So God is saying, do what you need to do. Now, if you say, yeah, but the way that they mass farm pork is cruel to the pigs themselves, then you may decide you don't want to eat mass produced pork because of the way that American farms produce mass produced pork. That's fine. That's a judgment call on your part. The Bible does not say that we're better off or not better off for being vegetarians or vegans. So here's where we get to. As I have this conversation with a number of folks, they tell me that one group will tell me that they're they're surprised, but they understand when I say that they're too loose and fast with the environment, that we do not own it, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and that we are responsible for being reasonable managers in our creative use of God's resources here on earth. Uh, and some others tell me that they're surprised. I've had even some young Christians tell me that really they're disappointed that Christians, especially older Christians, are not more caught up in environmental causes, that there's not more alarm, if you will, about climate change and things like that. So let me discuss just a couple of reasons why, and, and one is a Bible-based reason, and, and one is really an experience-based reason. Let me let me discuss a couple of reasons why that is. Maybe help the younger folks understand why some of the older folks don't have the alarm over climate change or the concern over climate change that they do. Let me back up and first say I, I did a podcast earlier where I talked about the Bible requires Christians to be very rational, to be very data and experience driven. And and here's the reason, and I'm not going to go back into that podcast You can go look it up. The Bible requires Christians to be rational podcast. But it's essentially this. The Bible says that we are led a lot by our emotions. We're led a lot by our intuitions. We're led a lot by what we naturally like and don't like. The Bible refers to us as having itching ears. And the Bible says that all of those things, those intuitions, that emotion, those itching ears, can be taken advantage of by what Paul in Romans 16 refers to as quote-unquote smooth talkers. And these quote-unquote smooth talkers can use our emotions, use our hate, use our fear against us, again, to quote the Apostle Paul in Romans, to quote-unquote lead us off into myths. So Christians want to be very careful. Everything we want to look at from a very data-driven, rational, logical approach. And here's the honest truth. And here, young people, are why so many old folks don't have the same alarmism over climate change that you do. Over the past, say, 100 years, 200 years, certainly my entire life of 50 plus years, there has been one environmental alarm after another that has been brought to the surface. Each one as alarming in its day as climate change is today. And literally, 
none of those environmental alarms have come to fruition. In fact, most of them haven't even come close to being fulfilled. When I was born, there was a book. I mean, I was months old, probably. And there was a book that came out by a big professor at Stanford University. And the name of the book was The Population Bomb. And in that original book, the first line read this. The battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death. In spite of any crash programs embarked upon now, at this late date, nothing can prevent a substantial increase in the world death rate. That's the threat. Young people today grow up under the threat of climate change. That's the threat I grew up under. In my day, elementary school, middle school, high school, that was the talk. The population bomb, waiting for it to explode. Because again, these brilliant university professors had said that nothing can be done at this late date to prevent it. Hundreds of millions of people were going to die, and they were going to die in the next decade. Not only did that not happen, but the population has since grown exponentially and we continue to be able to feed people. In fact, there's most years there's a glut of food, not a deficit of food. That was what is called the Green Revolution that took care of that. That's hardly the only thing. As I grew up, every nature program that I watched, it would talk about an animal, and then it would say that within my lifetime, usually within 10 or 20 years, that animal would be extinct, that there was nothing we could do, there was habitat loss, humans were encroaching, and I kept a list at one point, and I had about 77 animals on this list that the nature programs on PBS had convinced me were all going to go extinct. We talked about the dangers of acid rain in school. We talked about the world was running out of oil. We talked about that all the metals necessary for modern society to function were going to run out and the prices were going to skyrocket. And then believe it or not, when I was much younger, the threat wasn't about global warming, but about global cooling. That the breadbasket in Europe from France to Ukraine was not going to be able to produce the food to feed the world because of a global cooling issue. Needless to say, none of those things happen, but it tends to dull our senses. And so people my age say, fool me once, shame on you, but you're not going to fool me twice. There's actually an environmental writer. He's really a statistician who's a liberal environmentalist. His name is Bjorn Lomborg, and and Dr. Lomborg wrote a book called The Skeptical Environmentalist. And in this book, which I recommend every young person read, he goes through these different environmental catastrophes that were predicted and then talks about how they didn't come to fruition and why and what that means for the current environmental catastrophe predictions. As I began to go through high school and then college and graduate school and got out into my adult life, I came to cynically realize that most of these dramatic climate predictions, environmental predictions, weren't actually based on any science, but they were pretty bald marketing efforts. They they were fundraising efforts, if you will. I heard a congresswoman about three years ago say that within 10 years, the earth would be uninhabitable from climate change. Three years in, her prediction is not looking real well. Here's the truth. I would be surprised if she honestly believed that when she said it. Certainly, if she believed it, she should have changed her mind at this point. But either way, politicians have to run for office. They have to garner votes and they have to get funding for the laws that they want to pass. And it appears in more cases than not, again, these things are fundraising efforts rather than real science. And you don't have to turn this off and label me a climate denier. I'm not denying anything. The earth has warmed up. The globe has definitely warmed. In the past, oh, say, 80 years or so, the the globe has definitely warmed in the past 80 or 100 years. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I think the issue is what's causing it, how do we address it, 
What's the negative results if we address it this way? What's the positive results if we address it that way? I think that's where we're at. Here's Let me recommend a few more books to some of my young friends. And I'm obviously not going to recommend a book from anybody that was in the Trump administration or anything like that. Let me recommend a book. You should read Bjorn Lomborg's book, Skeptical Environmentalist. Let me also recommend a book from someone who was in the Obama administration, absolutely brilliant, brilliant person named Steve Coonan. He wrote a book called Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us and What It Doesn't. So again, this is a liberal professor, lifelong environmentalist, and member of the Obama administration. He gives a really on, and I would encourage not just my younger friends, but my older and, and very conservative friends to read it as well. This is an objective, honest look, unsettled, what climate science tells us and what it doesn't. There's other books, if you're interested, like The End of Doom or Apocalypse Never. These are written by folks that like have worked at Greenpeace and places like that. So again, it's a pretty honest, objective look at kind of what's going on. And what it tells us is, The earth is warming up. It has warmed up. Our thermometers tell us that there's a way that we can address that rationally. And there's a way that we can just cry wolf, try to raise some funds, try to pass some laws, but not really make as much of a difference as we want. And then here's the second reason that I don't think older Christians get as caught up in the climate change alarm as younger Christians do. One, we just don't see the world ending in 10 years. The world will not be uninhabitable in 100 years. And at the current pace, the world will not be uninhabitable in 500 years based on climate change. It will be different. There's no doubt. The world will be very different in 500 years if the climate continues to change the way that it has in the past. It will not be uninhabitable, however. But most folks would say, yeah, we don't want it to be as different as it's predicted to be. I can certainly understand that. Christians, older Christians, still, we don't get as caught up in the environmental alarms for one simple reason. And let me read you a verse from Ecclesiastes, where the wise King Solomon writes this, Ecclesiastes 3, 10 and 11. I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. It's really straightforward. God putting eternity in man's heart means that God gives us this desire to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. God gives us a desire to be part of something, to influence something, participate in something that, if you will, will leave a legacy beyond us. And for many folks who do not have involvement in the kingdom of God, that only opportunity to be involved in something bigger, to leave that legacy they see is through environmental issues. And so they begin to march and berate those who are against them on this because they really think it's the way they're going to leave their mark, if you will. But when it says that God has put eternity in man's heart, God is telling us, King Solomon is telling us, the real way to fill your heart's eternity is with kingdom issues. The only thing we will do that will ultimately last forever and make an eternal difference is if we work in God's kingdom. So here's what I would say. For those who aren't as active in the kingdom, who aren't working on kingdom issues to fill their heart's eternity, they will tend to take more issue, become more involved, and I would even argue be more extreme on environmental issues because it's the only issue with which they're trying to fill their heart's eternity. But as we begin to fill fill our heart's eternity with kingdom issues, the environment is still important. Being God's steward is still important. And working to address environmental harm that humans might be doing is still important, but it does take a more balanced approach. We're not set off by every alarm. We're not dramatically impacted by every fundraising effort. And we can rationally work with the other side of the aisle, if you will, to come up with better, more permanent solutions that address our problems without dramatically changing the world that we live. 
All right, folks, that's my comments on Christians and the environment, why there's such a wide gap between different Christians about it. Again, reasonable Christians can draw the line in a different place for where use of the environment versus abuse of the environment is. So let's please be Christian-like and civil as we address and discuss these conversations and rationally go back, read books like Skeptical Environmentalist and Unsettled, and then make an honest, logical determination for yourself where you need to stand on these issues. Thanks for listening. Until next time, this is Andy.